the Chinese regime cracked down on the people of Hong Kong. So now, the US is cracking down on the Chinese regime, kicking them right in the Welcome back to China Uncensored, I'm Chris Chappell. This episode is sponsored by Surfshark. You should be using a VPN like Surfshark to protect yourself whenever you go online, especially if you're in Hong Kong. Because on July 1st, the Chinese regime enacted a brutal national security law to crush protesters and political dissent in Hong Kong. US lawmakers condemned this move. But unlike what normally happens when politicians say stuff, this time, they're backing it up with serious action. Earlier this month, the US government sanctioned 11 Hong Kong and Chinese officials for their role in the Chinese Communist Party's ongoing crackdown in Hong Kong. Those officials include Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam, the current and former Hong Kong police chiefs, and the top mainland Chinese officials in Hong Kong. Those sanctions were implemented under an executive order from President Trump and the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, a bipartisan bill that was unanimously passed by Congress. Now, I talked about these sanctions in an earlier episode, but what I didn't get into is how these US sanctions could have a huge impact on Hong Kong's financial system. They could also cripple the Chinese economy. And here's the key. These sanctions could also directly hurt the wealth of Chinese Communist Party officials, which will make them sad. So what do these sanctions do? Initially, they just mean that the 11 sanctioned officials can't travel to the US. They can't own any assets in the US, and they can't do business with any US individuals or companies. And some of the officials have laughed it off. Lo Hui Ning, the top Chinese official in Hong Kong, said he didn't have any US assets, and he offered to send Trump $100 for him to freeze. My favorite Chinese state from media, The Global Times, called that a humorous response. Oh, Lo, what a kidder. I can't wait for his stand-up comedy special. Meanwhile, Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam said that she didn't have any U.S. assets and didn't like going to the U.S. anyway, so there. But I don't think she's thought this through. Sure, she may not go to the U.S., but she probably uses services from U.S. companies. The sanctions affect that, too. What happens when her Netflix subscription gets canceled? She's going to have to watch horrible shows from Hong Kong's TVB, like My Lover from the Planet Meow. Yes, that's a real show. Lam later admitted that she was having a little bit of trouble with her credit cards because of the sanctions. But Carrie Lam's problems will go beyond just not being able to get her Chase Rewards points or having to mooch off her son's Netflix account. Because even if these officials aren't taking the sanctions seriously, you know who is? Banks. Yes, Hong Kong's financial institutions are gripped by anxiety over US sanctions. That's because the Hong Kong Autonomy Act doesn't just require President Trump to sanction individual officials who undermine Hong Kong autonomy. It also requires sanctions on financial institutions that do business with these officials. Within 60 days of the sanctions on these officials, the Trump administration has to identify any foreign financial institution that knowingly conducts a significant transaction with them. And if a bank gets caught doing a significant transaction, then the banks get punished. Within one year, five of these sanctions must be implemented. And within two years, all of these sanctions must be. And they mean the bank is basically banned from doing business with the US. Yeah, that's why these banks are gripped by anxiety. And if you're thinking, well, they have two years before all of the sanctions are required, that's not necessarily the case. They only have up to two years. The Trump administration is moving fast. Under the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, the Trump administration had three months to name officials and a year to sanction them. They named and sanctioned officials in three weeks. And while the sanctions on those individuals are politically important, when it comes to actually affecting the Chinese Communist Party, the sanctions on foreign banks 
are the big guns. Now, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority has tried to reassure Hong Kong banks that they don't need to comply with the sanctions on Hong Kong officials because they were U.S. sanctions and not United Nations sanctions. That's not how the banks see it, though. On one hand, if these banks keep doing business with sanctioned officials, they risk getting sanctioned themselves by the U.S. On the other hand, if they stop doing business with these officials, they could be violating the new national security law in Hong Kong, which outlaws sanctions. Article 29 of the city's national security law prohibits the imposition of sanctions, blockades, or other hostile actions against Hong Kong or the mainland, potentially putting banks in a bind if they abide by the U.S. decrees. So either choice is bad. And if banks choose to leave Hong Kong because they're worried about violating U.S. law or Chinese law, that could wreck Hong Kong's financial industry. Even Chinese state-owned banks are worried about U.S. sanctions. That's because if Chinese banks do get sanctioned, they essentially lose access to the U.S. financial system, which is a huge deal. In worst-case scenarios, the lenders are looking at the possibility of being cut off from U.S. dollars or losing access to U.S. dollar settlements. And that's a problem because the dollar is the dominant global currency for international payments and central bank reserves. Since the bulk of dollar transactions are cleared through American banks, the U.S. can argue that those transactions pass through U.S. soil, thereby giving the U.S. legal jurisdiction over them. That means that those dollar transactions made by Chinese state-owned banks are subject to U.S. sanctions. Also. Hong Kong's currency is pegged to the U.S. dollar, and analysts say that there could be long-term risks to that because of the Hong Kong Autonomy Act. The dollar peg is what enables Hong Kong to be an international financial center. The freely convertible and stable Hong Kong dollar is especially important to China for attracting foreign investment and in turn allowing Chinese companies to easily raise hard currency in the city. Hong Kong is the main place where Chinese businesses can get U.S. dollars, which is important because Chinese banks are running out of U.S. dollars. And they need those U.S. dollars to be able to do business overseas. For example, Belt and Road projects are overwhelmingly financed in the U.S. currency. Speaking of doing business overseas, the U.S. sanctions could also directly affect the wealth of Chinese Communist Party officials and their families. That wealth is highly connected to Hong Kong. For example, a New York Times investigation found that relatives of three of the top four members of China's Communist Party have in recent years bought luxury homes in Hong Kong worth more than $51 million combined. According to China expert Willie Lam, members of the red aristocracy in China, including the princelings, have made huge investments in Hong Kong. If Hong Kong suddenly loses its financial status, they cannot park their money here. And it goes deeper than that. This is Li Qianxin. She's the daughter of the third highest ranking Chinese Communist Party official, Li Jianshu. She owns a $15 million property in Hong Kong. She's also the chairwoman of China Construction Bank International. That's a subsidiary of China Construction Bank, which as a branch in New York City. It's also one of the Chinese state-run banks that's worried about U.S. sanctions on Hong Kong. What would happen if China Construction Bank got sanctioned by the U.S. government? Well, under the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, one of the possible sanctions is that officers of the bank would also be sanctioned. That means Li Qianxin, multi-millionaire and daughter of the third highest ranking Chinese Communist Party official, could be considered an officer of that bank and get personally sanctioned. So like I said, these sanctions could directly hurt the power and wealth of Communist Party officials and their families. And that's one thing that might possibly change the Communist Party's crackdown on Hong Kong. Maybe. And speaking of Hong Kong, this episode is sponsored by Surfshark. When you go online, especially in Hong Kong, you need to be using a VPN like Surfshark to protect your identity. 
Everything you do online is being tracked and logged by the websites you visit and your internet service provider, and in many cases, by the government. And if you're in an authoritarian country like China, this kind of tracking can put you at risk of surveillance and even arrest. So I recommend you use Surfshark to protect yourself online. When you use Surfshark's clean web mode, you'll be protected from trackers plus a lot of ads and malware. With one account, you can connect as many devices as you want. Try it out with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And Surfshark has a special discount for China Uncensored fans. Go to surfshark.com slash uncensored and use the code uncensored to get our special deal that includes three extra months for free. Click the link below. Once again, I'm Chris Chappell. See you next time.